Louis Chudasoki, Boston University. I'm the George and Joyce Wine Chair of African American Studies, a professor of English and the director of the African American Studies program. And I'm also the editor-in-chief of the Black Scholar Journal, which I must plug as the number one journal of black studies in the country. Through science fiction and through music, through narratives of artificial intelligence going back through robotics to the present, but also through music. And they began to overlap because one of my primary theses when I started doing my work was um, that black engagements with technology occurred primarily in the musical sphere. And largely because it was musical, we tended to dismiss it as technological. Um, or sorry, dismiss it as not being technological, when in fact it is technology. Um, during the era of um, the so-called digital divide, I just found it fascinating that while all the conversations were rampant about um, minority access to technology and blacks in their relationship to technology and technology being antagonistic towards blacks, young black men and women in their bedrooms and projects in New Jersey and council flats in London were producing the most sophisticated electronic music on the planet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the world was acknowledging this really sophisticated electronic music at the same time as there's being these discourses of a digital divide. Mm -hmm. That just didn't make sense to me, mm -hmm. especially since um, coming up through these um, musical subcultures, they seem to be so technology focused. Um, you were celebrated by, for your knowledge of technology, your ability to mix and remix and reshape technology and re, you know, rewire and re-rig things. And so I thought something's going on in how we understand technology vis-a-vis -vis race. Mm -hmm. And so that got me thinking more about technology, reading more about technology as a way of finding out um, the history of black interactions with technology, particularly communications technology. And that, of course, led me to the conversations about technology, which become increasingly focused on artificial intelligence at this time. And because of my history as a fan and scholar of science fiction, they began to overlap right there. Excellent. And it, did, and it really helped when, um, in the 80s, a number of science fiction narratives began to explicitly refer to black music on a regular basis. Mm. Particularly William Gibson's Neuromancer with Rastafarians mm. and reggae music, <laughs> you know. And I was at that time writing about how reggae music was the beginning of sampling and looping and chopping and doing all these things to sound. So there seemed a very clear parallel between conversations about technological rewiring and remixing and cybernetics. And so those things began to make sense to me through the narratives because the writers seemed to kind of intuitively understand that something was going on. Emma Bull is another writer who did that and Neil Stevenson to a lesser extent, but yeah. In terms of how it's being communicated in general, um, it's funny. Looking back in the, um, when, when we began to switch to digital production and began to make sense of new, the new software right that was coming out in the 80s and samplers and all of that the big interest was midi at the time right and midi and that in a sense was artificial intelligence right having one centralized intelligence making sense of all of the different machines and controlling them and so i thought that the musicians were much more at ease with ai than the writers were. Mm -hmm. um, in science fiction, AI is, as a part of the long tradition of seeing technology as antagonistic, AI was just this increasingly threatening presence that threatened the centrality of the human being, threatened the centrality of human organizing consciousness, and just threatened the principality of humans in these narratives of culture. And musicians didn't feel that, but writers certainly did, right? And so I think that in terms of the kinds of communication about artificial intelligence that were coming out when I began to discover it, it was almost all negative, and that's from science fiction. Um, I can't, on, I mean, I'm sure there were science fiction stories and, not, and novels where AI was a good thing, but I can't recall any of them. <laughs> it's all pretty bad, from Wintermute and in, 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 um, Neuromancer, I just can't imagine I can't think of any. However, I also found it very interesting that AI began to be narrated as a kind of 
insurgent deity, right? A new kind of God figure that threatened older narratives of God, right? Some of these science fiction writers would have the AI figure there appearing alongside Obatala and West African deities. Now that would happen in these narratives, right? And so it was a sort of religious you know, um, contest and that was just a part of the anxiety. So I can't really think that of any science fiction that introduced AI in a positive way in the early days. Um, I know that there are a couple of writers now who have tried to domesticate AI, right? I'm thinking of Nalo Hopkinson, who turns AI into this sort of maternal, Afrocentric figure, right? I'm still suspicious of that, perhaps because of my previous suspicion, <laughs> right, of, mater of dominant maternal or paternal figures, right? But um, I don't think science fiction did it well, I guess if that's the answer to the direct answer to the question. Science fiction didn't do it well. Music did it well because the musicians all felt empowered. They didn't feel like they were being decentered by MIDI or some sort of central organizing principle. In fact, if you look at music as an example, as electronic music became more and more popular, the critics of electronic music responded to it in the way that people respond to AI. It's there's no personality, it's it's not really you, it's not really creative, it's someone else really doing it. Whereas musicians were like, no, we feel completely organically interconnected with the sounds that are coming. It's their instrument, right? So that was interesting. So I suppose for me, I came up noticing all of these different takes on what would be called AI, mm -hmm. right? So I don't know if that answers the question directly, but... No, I think it does. You know, it also depends on what science fiction one reads. You know, there's always the science fiction that's just pure R&D, <laughs> right? Celebrating all the new technologies, etc. But from the new wave in the 60s, there's been a strong current of criticism of technological development and its impact on culture. And that's really where I come from in terms of studying and reading science fiction, right? Um, what was the question again, sorry? The influence that science fiction has had on perhaps technologists' descriptions of these systems. Yes, in media, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, in media. Public. Yeah, in media, I think that most of the understanding of technology and AI has been corporate. Right, um, it's not been educational. Mm -hmm. It's not been in terms of cultural value. It's been in terms of marketing. Right, what can this thing do for um, corporations and for companies and for you know labor? And I, I don't, I don't really have a sense that mainstream media has described artificial intelligence as something that is manageable, engageable directly by human beings. It's already narrated as being out of our hands, right? And, and that's perhaps where the science fiction writers are more suspicious of it, but in media that's how it's narrated. And I think that the increasing discomfort people have with artificial intelligence is due to how it's narrated in culture as a thing that's A, a fait accompli, <laughs> right? And it's bigger than you and you can't really think about it. Um, therefore, you must trust these technologists to handle it, which is a dangerous narrative because that narrative goes back to the 19th century. Trust the scientists, trust the technologists. Then we've got World War II. We've got World War I and World War II, right? So there's an inbuilt in, you know, insecurity around these narratives of technology, but that tech optimism, I just think is so now wed to corporate culture that AI, I don't think, is seen as outside of being outside of that, mm -hmm. right? Even in the cyberpunk narratives that introduced a lot of AI to a lot of mainstream readers and viewers, it's, I mean, where in science fiction do you see AI not being a part of a corporation? <laughs> and aren't the corporations increasingly malevolent in these narratives, right? And I don't just mean science fiction books, I mean in films, right? And I think that's really how AI emerges in popular um, consideration as a threatening corporate force. Yeah, this is all down the line for me, um, in the sense that I don't feel fully equipped yet. I've only become courageous enough to dive into the conversation, and I think that's a problem. I think that the conversation is deliberately muddied, mm 
<laughs> I think it's deliberately off-putting to people. And part of my responsibility and the responsibility of others who aren't coming out of that context professionally is to find their way into the conversation so that they can then talk to other people about it. So it's a new responsibility in the wake of the, the, the last book. I didn't think that after I wrote that book, um, I would be so involved in these conversations about technology. But it's a new sense of responsibility because by looking at science fiction, blacks in music, thinking about ethics and algorithms and things like that, I find I find uh, um, that it's important for someone who, even on the edges of these conversations, to get a little bit deeper in them, because I'm finding that people are sort of looking at me as a way to understand the conversation or to be less intimidated by the conversation. So, you know, I don't mind falling on my face so that I can sort of open up the conversation a bit more. So that's my responsibility. Um, I believe that there. It, there's a responsibility for people who are not in the profession, who are not experts, to start having these conversations. It's the, it's the what I call the Brian Eno strategy, right? Mm -hmm. To be, you know, he was all, he's infamous for being the non-expert in the room, mm -hmm. and I think we need more of that. And so th that's a position I'm sort of taking, trying to take on for myself. Um, in answering the question, I'm sort of torn between representations of AI. <laughs> <laughs> An actual AI, right? And it's tough for me to differentiate because I'm still learning more about actual AI, mm -hmm. right? Um, in public conversation, there is the promise of a world without labor, right? <laughs> Full automation, maybe machines or robots will pay taxes, I don't know, right? There are all these conversations out there. But I think the sense that AI will handle things for us, right? It goes beyond for most people the sense that, okay, it's gonna make work easier. I think it's actually this sense that it might replace work, right? And I think that's part of the promise of it. Um, from the 19th century to the present, the history of labor and its relationship to, to technology has also been one shot through with the manipulation of corporate and capitalist power. Right, And so I don't know that we can understand technology and labor without thinking about how corporate and capitalist power sort of plays with labor and plays with machines in s different ways over time, you know what I mean? So um, it's not, I don't see a steady narrative from let's say slavery, industrialization, all the way to the, pre I, I don't see a steady narrative. I just see constant disruptions back and forth um, as forces of power use technology and forces um, of labor resist that technology, right? So, yeah, I don't have a clear picture of how it's, I mean, certainly it's made, I mean, the promise of labor being less central to human life in the West is balanced by the narrative of outsourcing <laughs> and labor being dispatched elsewhere, and so, um, labor sometimes seems to disappear, and so we have this idea that therefore there's, l there's less of it necessary, and manual labor, but that's just because it's somewhere else and you don't see it. It's less visible. It's less visible. It's actually disappearing. Exactly. So it's things like that that complicate the smooth narrative that you might have, that the more technology, the more automation, the more leisure time, which is sort of these old arguments, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, it's just more displacement of leisure and more socioeconomic um, um, tension just sort of spread out across the planet. Back to the representation of machines and artificial intelligence or the representation of an increasingly powerful technological superstructure, right? I think that there is always a fear of the loss of dignity. Now, I'm not one to romanticize drudgery, right? I'm not one to say necessarily that work makes the person, right? Homo economicus or whatever. I don't really know that I believe that, right? But I do believe that there's a constant fear of losing agency, and losing agency is connected to losing dignity, meaning losing centrality.
right? And so that is a part of the narrative of how people respond to technology. And that's a part of the narrative of how people um, will respond to new developments that are sort of sold to them mm -hmm. as um, antidotes for work or a way to increase leisure, et cetera. People feel, I think the initial response is, where in this equation is my power? Right? And so there's a lot of anxieties about power. Um, and of course it matches up in terms of race, in terms of class, and certainly in terms of gender. Right? And so there's every introduction <laughs> of some new technology um, that isn't, for example, rooted in manual, clearly masculine kind of labor, um, will be translated as some sort of threat to some degree of one's subjectivity and agency. Like a real, a real live living tool, a or real a real live living tool, or within your own work in terms of literary analysis, if there's a particular representation of that dynamic between user and tool. This is tough. Um, as I said, in science fiction, in the research that I've done in science fiction, AI is almost always connected to corporations. Mm -hmm. It's almost always connected to banks, <laughs> right? Or it has access to your information and therefore access to you um, in nefarious ways, right? Um, but that's also how I think, uh, when I think, if you look for an actual tool, I think of these massive systems of knowledge and research and information um, gathering out there. Um, that's terrifying. Um, I, I know very few people who aren't research scientists or who aren't involved in AI research who aren't terrified <laughs> by this. Just the idea that there are, for example, here's a specific tool, there are um, algorithms out there that are determining whether or not I can get a bank loan. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and and that's quite terrifying. I mean, I think about specific instances like before, you know, I had family members going through this, right, right before 2008, right? Um, those are real tools. And there is no, and after what happened in 2008, I mean, there's a sense in which these forces of knowledge production, that's what they are, right? They gather information, produce knowledge, and then they sell that knowledge, right? There's no sense of accountability because it's so far beyond our ken, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, that's a very specific instance of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, facial recognition stuff, right? How it manifests and people of color, black men in particular, right? I mean, these tools are, and it's not that, I mean, clearly the tools are still being perfected. They're still being perfected. But every time you hear about how they're being perfected, they're being perfected because they've made this really weird and unpleasant mistake that is about your race or your gender or denied somebody money in some way, right? And that's, that's not feeding any greater public comfort in these systems. Now it's funny, this is what happens. When, the ro when, when you move from robot to AI, you move from embodied to disembodied, right? There may be some embodied AI out there that we can talk about too, but when most people think about AI, they're thinking about um, this sort of distributed consciousness in the broader systems of power and finance, right? And it's tough as human beings, other than religious discourse, we don't have a lot of languages, language to ascribe agency to distributed power, <laughs> right? We, God, yes, <laughs> right? But with AI, we, it's distributed, it's disembodied, but it's centralized in a way, at least this is how it's understood. And it's not necessarily right? associated with capital or corporation because it can be diffused. It can, exactly. It can be ascribed to a national or governmental entity, but it can also be diffused. Transnationally, yes. right? Yeah, and these things, and, and, and I don't think it's because we're scholars we're talking about it. I think people are actually are struggling to make sense of what this thing is, mm -hmm. right? And especially since it's not a thing, <laughs> right? It's very depending on its function. Yeah, exactly. And all of that just means it's more and more beyond our ken and therefore more and more not responsible to us and not, um, you know, um, I won't say not legitimate, but certainly 
attains a position of power and agency greater than our own. And that's what I think terrifies folks, absolutely. And I'm not as terrified as people are about it, but I'm interested in the fact that they are in fact afraid simply because it's so disembodied and so widespread. And these specific tools, where we do, where we, it's one thing to say, well, the problem with that tool is this, <laughs> right? Now we're talking, I mean, the problem with these algorithms, <laughs> that's just a hard thing for people to even process, right? Mm -hmm. All we know is the way they manifest problematically, you know? So I want to push on this a little bit further. Please do. Because you have this um, vantage point of studying cultural history yeah. over time. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about this anxiety and the... Um, the imbalance of power of individuals to these seemingly um, nefarious systems. Um, or seen as nefarious simply because they don't have power over them. Yes. <laughs> well, see, but that's the thing, though. I think when we're talking about distributed s subjectivities or distributed systems, and uh, I think that it's disempowering. There is no sense of actual engagement with it at all. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, to say that, for example, that Amazon is operating, you know, with um, some systems or artificial intelligence systems and sorting and research, etc., doesn't really tell me a lot. Um, it is a fiction to suggest that my choice of this particular object or item that it shows up in the mail three days later, it's a fiction for me to think that that interaction is me negotiating equally <laughs> with this broader system that has greater knowledge and access to my history that I don't even I don't even have. Right? It's yeah. I I think that most not, I'm, I'm no populist. God knows, but I think that most interactions. Um, would rather not imagine the broader context of AI in these interactions and they would rather just see it as just a basic economic interaction. You're the shop, transaction. <laughs> a transaction, transaction, and I'm the customer, right? A transaction I, rather than a relationship. Exactly, perhaps. yeah. And if you ask folks to sort of think beyond that as to what do you think is going on on that side, that's when things get really unpleasant and complicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, do you see or perceive value in the prospect of machine autonomy? <laughs> value? Uh, value to who? Um, I see if I'm, you know, a maker, a, a seller, <laughs> I see infinite forms of value. I think if I'm, you know, looking for quote unquote free labor, Right. If I'm looking for off automation, that's going to work better for me economically and socioculturally. Of course, all kinds of value there. Um, I can see that for some it would produce supposedly more leisure time, which is the narrative of robotics and artificial, one of the narratives, right? They do the work and you wouldn't have to do much. So I see value there. Other than those kinds of examples, I just I don't. If you're asking for sort of more of a metaphysical value, I don't I don't know that I see any. And I'm not a hostile to the idea mm -hmm. because I'm one of those people who sort of is sort of um, accepts that there's a certain inevitability about these things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure value can be made and will be made. One of the beautiful things I've learned from science fiction and from blacks in music production is. The intention of the of the maker may not be how the machine will ultimately be used. <laughs> um, you know the old cliche from Bruce Sterling, which I've uh, not Bruce Sterling, but from um, William Gibson: "The street finds its own uses for things." <laughs> right? I've always thought that was fascinating because I'm like any black person anywhere in the world could have said that. <laughs> right? Right? Or you know, I'm studying some work now on. Um, daily machines in colonial India, the use of um, mundane machines in colonial India. Anyone then could have said that, right? The way that things get rewired. So I see value being added to some of these things. Uh, we know that much music production, um, people of color get no, get no 
um, historical credit for certain things, but one of the reasons certain software adjusted, you know, um, its sonic capacities was because these kids were saying, we need the bass in the red. Mm -hmm. Right, without distortion, right? Or we need this, or we need a broader sonic field, and they did all these weird things to it. Same thing with drum machines, etc. And then they listened, and you know, right? Um, that, that's a concrete example of sort of working with um, technology um, on the street. And I could go on for days about the Caribbean culture and what happened there with how they sort of really changed how we listen to sound because of their domestic refiguring of, of, um, or of um, sound technology, right? So we know from science fiction and from real life that people will take these machines and add value and do different things to them. So that is something I know will happen. It's reinscribing the power negotiation. It is a negotiation on that level, I agree, absolutely. It does, re it's, but it's also a form of resistance too. Right, it's a form of acknowledging that this strange thing has been sort of imposed on me, or it's been ge it's generated its own value because it is this f shiny object that comes from this socioeconomic place and represents whatever it represents. Right, but we can now take it and turn it into something else. So it is a negotiation there, which is why I'm probably less anxious about these sort of things. I know that you know the way that these things are imagined to work will never. Actually, it's never going to work out that way, you know. Mm -hmm. I've been most inspired by the time I spent, it's been a while since I've been there, but I've written about it. In Nigeria, in these areas, you've probably seen documentaries of these computer graveyards in Nigeria and Ghana. I've been blown away because I've just watched kids who are now being tutored by older boys, who are tutored by older men who've been living in these graveyards of computers for decades and the things that they're able to do with no education <laughs> whatsoever has been stunning and so when I see things like that I see an expanded technological field um, that's being that's not being paid attention to by the center but in the same way that Sony eventually had to adjust for what happened with the TR-808 in Brooklyn <laughs> I hope and suspect that maybe Apple will one day respond to something these guys in Ghana the Sakawa boys in Ghana are doing with machines I, I, I suspect that at some point that might happen and then we're seeing a large sort of negotiation mm -hmm. right yeah, it's interesting because I wanted to move in the conversation towards the potential pitfalls of machine autonomy. Um, I like your optimism. <laughs> the previous example, even that's one just, of them. <laughs> yeah, but if you could talk a little bit about the pitfalls, your talk last night touched on notions of apocalypse and post-apocalyptic narratives. Yeah, um, and this. Uh, the image of the graveyard, the <laughs> computer graveyard, is interesting in, in terms of this um, second wave generation well, of appropriation and reappropriation of tools. And, and generation. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I guess I'm still thinking about the first part of your question, though, because I haven't thought about it other than um, in practical terms. What are the What's the value of a machine autonomy in practical terms? And I, I kind of answered those answered that question a little bit ago, but I, I know I didn't answer it that great because I haven't really thought about it, um, other than how much value it produces for someone. Um, I'm, when we think about, when I accept the inevitability of certain things, I do accept the inevitability of more and more machines to run with less and less of me. <laughs> right, I'm, I'm seeing it happen all the time, and we kind of forget the process, right? Human forgetting is crucial to this, right? We forget how much already inscribed into this we are, right? And by the time we discover it, and that's when these narratives of panic sort of show up, but it's like, like usually way too late, right? Um, I, I would like to seem indifferent to autonomy. I would, I would like to seem indifferent. I, I know that there are narratives that are terrified of machine autonomy and then there are narratives that celebrate machine autonomy. I honestly don't know how I feel in terms of the value of autonomy 
in itself, mm -hmm. right? Um, I do know, however, or I do suspect that once you have acknowledged autonomy, like full autonomy, if in fact that's possible, I don't know, but let's say once you have that, then you, human culture, has to make sense of this autonomy in terms familiar to us, which are anthropomorphic or centralized or hierarchical, right? I. I don't think we can... Negotiations begin. Yes. How social interaction and relations... Well, we'll continue more openly. Because <laughs> they're always going yeah, on, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah, at that point, absolutely, it's about um, making sense of these autonomous forces, pulses, mm -hmm. beings. What? There's, there's going to be more mm -hmm. conversation about that. And if those things are connected to nefarious structures of power or structures of power that are seen as amoral or not necessarily engageable by you, that's going to be, well, that is a problem. Mm -hmm. That is a problem. Um, and that goes back to the question of agency, feeling more and more disempowered, mm -hmm. more and more disempowered. Yeah. yeah. Because the topic often will come up with weaponry. Oh, absolutely. Right? So absolutely. And I, I parallel the weaponry conversation with um, finances, mm -hmm. right? It's your money yeah. <laughs> and um, credit and that sort of thing. I think it's, it's, that stuff is already beyond most human comprehension, mm -hmm. right? And then to imagine a system of knowledge or a system of knowledge production that is responsible for that, right, on your behalf, I think is deeply problematic for a lot of folks, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Where responsibility will be ascribed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of the conversation folks are trying to figure out, right? Whose fault is it? Right? <laughs> and then, of course, well, who's the who? Yeah. Right? But, but I think. Personhood. 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 But, the, but, the, but the question really is who do I sue? Yes. <laughs> right? Because that's the thing about when I pay attention to the conversations about self driving cars and things like that, it's like to a certain extent, some degree, some amount of death is inevitable. But the question is is it more or less than the death that would happen if it was just a person driving the car? Right? Um, th I think the real issue for people is, is death more acceptable <laughs> when a human being does it than when a machine does it? And I actually think most people would say yes, <laughs> because we can ascribe blame, we know who to sue, we know who to cry for, and who to you know, we know who to cry. And humans right? are understood as fallible. Exactly. Exactly. Whereas with the machines, it becomes not just distributed in terms of the networks of, of um, agency who's involved and etc. But I just, there's the emotional weight of this kind of question, violence and death, is not there. Because we've control, perceivably, to that system. Exactly. And if that were the case, perhaps we are responsible for that. Well, uh, that, that <laughs> <laughs> because of the relinquishing of control, perhaps. well, then you're asking something that's not going to happen, which is blame yourself. <laughs> 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 that's not going to happen. <laughs> that's not going to happen. You know, right. But no, it is the, the, the attri attributing blame and responsibility is a powerful thing because then it becomes a, a way in which I think one can escape blame, right? Because here's the thing, no one believes that self-driving cars, for example, will be voted in. No one believes that it's going to be voted in. They're going to be imposed, <laughs> right? <laughs> Right? Same thing with all of these systems, right? And I think that fundamental power imbalance is going to mark all of the relationships all the way through. If I were to be able to speak to people who are really involved in AI and this kind of technology, I would say your challenge is to find a way to make it, to render it um, engageable <laughs> early on so that people don't just see it as purely abstract all the time. It's like the, conver the earlier conversation that we'd had in regards to rights being taken. Exactly. Rather than offered. The rather than offered. Exactly. But like I said, I don't see 
you know, just like no one voted for those algorithms that worked with um, real estate values and <laughs> no one voted for those things. They just, boom, you know, they were just introduced and then fragmented into all these other forms of very interesting, you know, economic um, technologies. No one voted for them. And so no one expects any of these things to be voted for, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Whether, what do I think about it just in general? Yeah. Well, the of it, I'm wondering, you know, sometimes I, I, I am very, very happy to have met some scientists who don't like what I do. Um, because they've said, you know, we don't know all that theory, cultural criticism stuff, right? And I'm like, fine, you know, I don't know half of what you're doing. But they'll be like, a lot of this stuff is premised on stuff that's just not going to happen. Right, like general artificial <laughs> intelligence. So I'm not. I'm, just, I'm wondering if I've been inf influenced by them, or I'm taking refuge in them. <laughs> Am I actually going? Okay, well, if the real scientists say it's never going to happen, maybe I should stop thinking about it. <laughs> um, so there's that, right? Um, if it were, or if it's well, I know it's something people are working on. Uh, and at a certain point, it will work on itself, right? <laughs> right? Um, if that's not already happening, I don't know. It's an inevitability. I don't know that this has anything to do with what we humans can do. I mean, I mean, we're already feeling more now than ever that the political system is beyond our ability to deal with. And after 2008, the economic system, the financial system, way beyond our control, then to ask, <laughs> how do we deal with something that pr promises to be bigger than and able to manage those things? No, I, <laughs> it's, it's, it's beyond even conceptions of God, right? So yeah, I... I don't have a response other than there's a sense of inevitability, right? And there are things that one thinks about, like, as I said earlier, about the creolization of technology on the street, right? What will happen in response to it? Um, I certainly accept, for good and for bad, that human beings will do things not expected, <laughs> right? Or not accepted, um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to add that we didn't talk about? Um, yes, I'm happy to have these conversations. Like I said, I, I've only recently started thinking about these questions and I'm, I'm, I'm only recently learning what the questions are that you folks are dealing with and I'm really excited by them and it makes me want to get more into the conversation because I feel like I stumbled into it through sci-fi and music. but it's really inspiring to actually see how the problems are being framed by those who are further in the conversation than I am. That's very helpful, so I'm grateful for that. Well, thank you, because I think you're actually leading the conversation. Oh, that's a, <laughs> no way. <laughs> thank you.